<laughs> What's going on, y'all? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. Time for another episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit Out of Secrets of Magic. Today, the Magus Archetype. Slapping it on a very powerful class to see just how dumb we can get. Spoilers, it's real dumb. Remember, if you're liking what you're seeing, to like, subscribe, ding the bell. Stay caught up on all your stuff for now. Let's dive in. Let me preface what I'm about to say by saying that I think this is the most damage I've done in second edition so far. I have not crunched the math numbers yet. Yeah, I guess we're doing that today because we have to because it's a lot. One thing I've said a lot about first edition that I like is the bloat. The longer things go on, the more content is released, the wider the catalog one can reach from is, and the more options like this with really terrifying combinations exist. Are these combinations appropriate for every table? Probably not, but indeed this is a min-maxing video, so here we are. The goal of today's build is to use the Magus Archetype's Spell Strike ability, which functions exactly the same as it does for the normal Magus, that is to say, two actions, cast a spell that takes one or two actions, make a strike, you strike and spell at the same time, except we can only do ours once in combat. Recharging Spell Strike for the Archetype Magus can only happen as an activity that takes a minute. So short of like invisibility -ing in combat and sitting for 10 rounds before nuking again, which I guess is kind of valid we're looking to hit once really really hard and then the rest of the time just be a damn good damaging character which i think we've pulled off pretty well this build is also letting me break out a bunch of stuff from lost omens the mwangi expanse for today's ancestry the quill coat shisk is what we're looking at you all heard me rave about this reaction and follow this card right up here if you happened to not not only does the shisk get ability score ups where we want them it also is really really good at just slamming damage down on someone such that should we not happen to kill them with sneak attack and then they attack us, we can push the rest of that damage home. Continuing our theme of rare backgrounds, because I think I like those way more than just, yeah, take whatever as long as it buffs these two stats, we'll take Feybound for our background. Our dexterity is important to us. The phase Fortune free action when attempting a skill check and having not rolled, roll with advantage for the very sneaky character of many archetypes seems good. Our class today is Rogue. We're choosing using Thief for the racket. There are many of you who might have thought Eldritch Trickster was the shoe in and while I'll agree that it's a very good racket, I think I would much rather just have dexterity to damage with a finesse melee weapon given that we only have so many spell slots anyway so that when we're out of juice we still have that as an option and when we have juice we can casually put our dexterity and intelligence both directly into the face of the enemy or the jugular or the wherever you've hit them. You get what I mean. For our starting ability scores, a strength of 10, a dexterity of 18, our most important stat by far, a con of 12. That feels so low for 2e, but like, just don't be where they can stab you. An intelligence of 14, a wisdom and charisma of 12. Intelligence is important, but since a higher intelligence does not get us extra spells in 2e, and a lot of our spells don't have DCs, we're making spell attacks with them, it's not as important to us, and we can afford to let our intelligence tick up as we go. As always, this build will be taking advantage of the free archetype optional rule. Next week, I'm making a video about why that's important, but we'll be taking not one, not two, not three, but four archetypes over the course of this build, just to pile on as much shenanigans as we can. Class feats, here we go. First, out the gate, twin faint. Is it weird for us? Yes. This is kind of just level one, let's get some damage in. For two actions, make one strike with each of your two melee weapons, both against the same target. The target is automatically flat-footed against the second attack. Apply the map normally. Because we don't get our magic stuff, for a little while at level one we're kind of just that person with bony quills and a presumably like a couple of short swords which is still really good because the second edition rogue is in fact really good next up unbalancing blow whenever you get a critical hit which i imagine we will be a lot in late game play the target is flat footed against your attacks until the end of your next turn in case they try to wiggle out of the flank or you're no longer invisible or what have you that is followed up immediately at level four with magical trickster when we succeed at a spell attack roll against a flat footed opponent's armor class and the spell deals damage we can sneak attack with say that telekinetic projectile or produce flame that we happen to be hucking as a cantrip because at this point indeed on the archetype side we have our magus dedication next up we'll take basic magus spell casting 
for the bounded spellcasting benefits, not the same as every other spellcasting archetype. Ostensibly, it means less spells and spell slots that fall off as you level. And then right after that, because at this point we've taken three feats from the Magus archetype we can dip out, we will dip into the Assassin dedication. This requires us to have alchemical crafting and be trained in crafting deception and stealth, three things that are very easy with the rogue to be trained in by the time we get here. This gives us the mark for death activity for three actions until your mark dies or you use this ability again. You get a plus two circumstance bonus to perception checks to seek your mark and on deception checks to faint meh. Your agile and finesse weapons and unarmed attacks get the backstabber and deadly d6 weapon traits while you're attacking this person. Should that weapon already have the deadly trait, the deadly trait's damage dice goes up by one step, which we will talk about more in a little bit. Expert backstabber right behind because our weapon of choice will automatically have backstabber, so we get a little extra damage stacked on. And then assassinate. For two actions, if you have designated a mark using mark for assassination and you are completely unnoticed by your mark, perhaps by the invisibility spell, make a strike against your mark. If you hit, your mark takes 6d6 extra precision damage with a basic fort save against your class DC or spell DC. They die if they crit fail. Is this the primary main objective? No, no it is not. But it is really cool extra tech to have. Again, if our spell strike's not recharged or if we just need a really, really goddamn powerful opening salvo in the combat. And again, with magic, it becomes a lot easier to facilitate this in games where the assassin is kind of a weird fit, because so often they just can be. It's much easier to get that minute observing the boss while they're monologuing in the boss room. If you can just sit quietly in the corner invisible, while like your champion is deus vaulting at the top of his lungs. Back to the rogue for precise debilitation next. We're jumping in here because we have the thief racket and we'd like to just slam an extra 2d6 precision damage on people when we hit them. Easy enough. If we were of a different racket, we would almost certainly be trying to make people clumsy so the reflex save was bad when they attacked us and then we could shish kebab them. God, is that what I'm calling that reaction? I guess that's what I'm calling that reaction. Next, we'll take expert wizard spellcasting. When did we get wizard? We're taking the wizard dedication on the archetype feat side. And then we're taking another wizard feat right next to this so we can qualify out. And then for our last two feats, take another archetype the duelist archetype. This gives us quick draw for free, wahoo. We're mostly here for the duelist challenge ability. For one action, select one foe you can see and shout at it. Well, I guess that doesn't have the auditory trait. You can presumably do this while sitting invisible somewhere. That foe is your dueling opponent until they are defeated, flee, or the encounter ends. Anytime you hit that enemy using a single one-handed melee weapon while your other hand or hands are free, you gain a circumstance bonus to the strike's damage equal to the number of damage dice your weapon deals, which is a shitload when you think about all the precision damage we're doing. My god, if this counted the damage from spell strike. Also, don't attack anyone else because it would be bad. On the archetype side, the Magus dedication at level 2, getting us our spellbook with four common arcane cantrips, the cast of spell activity, and two cantrips prepped each day from our spellbook, and all that other stuff you get, of course, followed by spell striker for the spell strike ability. Next, because it looks really fun, hybrid study spell to get the conflict spell from, in our case, Laughing Shadow and a focus pool with a single focus point in it. Does this recharge our stuff? No. Do we get other benefits? No. But it does net us the dimensional assault focus spell. For one action, you move half your speed, teleporting to any square in range that's within reach of a creature, and then attack them. Oopsie do, we just snapped into a flank and then snapped somebody's neck. It's super cool. Then force fang for a basically magic missile strike, which presumably does not get you sneak attack, but does get in chip damage, which is important. Next, we'll take expert magus spellcasting for a little more juice, then our wizard dedication for a little more juice, then it's basic wizard spellcasting for a little more juice, then it's arcane breath for a little more juice, then master magus spellcasting, then master wizard spellcasting for what? That's right, you guess it a little more juice. For our ancestry feats, first up, eidetic ear, so we can have that DC8 flat check to remember things. If we're showing up to a bi-weekly game, are very busy, I'm just adding myself a lot here. It's really important, it's really powerful. If you're sitting around invisible Batmanning, you're probably going to pick up some stuff. This can help you remember it. Renewing quills next, so the shish kebab can happen all the more. Unconventional weaponry from the humans is next. More on that in just a sec. Then none shall know because the ability to non-detection yourself when you're a sneaky assassin type. Right, that's super important. 
then secret eyes to have a little bit of a scout in front of us that isn't necessarily always us. For our general feats, we will be adopted by humans out the gate. This plus unconventional weaponry gives us access to the fang wire. It's agile and finesse, which does everything we want it to. It's damage dice is kind of meh on a D4, but that's fine because we have so many other dice from so many other sources that the D4 is just served to be knocked off the table and then like stepped on as you go up to get a drink. This also has backstabber, which means we'll get a little extra value from assassin things and deadly D8 which becomes deadly D10. It is also a one-handed weapon, which is admittedly a little weird because you're garroting someone how you do that one-handed is escaping me, but it's fine. Something, something, the secret of magic is assassinations. This weapon is like made for what we're trying to do. It's, it's disgusting. It's also on flavor for Lost Omens, the Mwangi Expanse, because kobolds are relatively common out that way. Not like staying in their caves being shunned by society. Shisk-like information. Shisk learn that Fangwire are real good. It's a tale as old as time. Then Toughness Die Hard, Incredible Initiative, Canny Acumen, Fortitude, basically staples on that side. Got a couple of skill feats we gotta talk about today. You're gonna have a lot of skills. We're really mad, so we like all of our ability scores. You could really spread these wherever you wanted to. First up, Shadow mark when you're attempting a stealth check to avoid notice while following that person you're gonna slit the throat of the target takes a minus two circumstance penalty to their perception DC this scales as we scale our proficiency in stealth if you start an encounter with the target while shadowing them the target takes that penalty to their initiative and to their perception DC to determine if they notice you before their head is rolling on the floor and they're looking down from on high as they're super dead and then foil senses the non-detection we get can get us past like true seeing if someone is casting it but other imprecise or precise senses that might be able to pick us up can kind of hurt us having something to hedge our bets pretty darn good for our key items the conducting rune once again so we can conduct energy through our garrot the wire is made of copper and you shocking grasp them the wire is made of super necromancy and you disintegrate i don't know more damage more good right the impactful rune lets our weapon deal an additional 1d6 force damage on a crit we can sometimes push people. And what might be the most weird mental image, the serrating rune. So essentially we have a tiny chainsaw garrot. That sounds very koboldy anyway. Our weapon deals slashing damage, now does 1d4 extra. For one action, you focus the power of the rune. On the next hit with the weapon, this turn that deals slashing damage, the serrating rune deals 1d12 additional damage instead, and then the shards slow back down. This is, again, another tool in the toolbox. On its own, it kind of is just like greatest striking rune, but if we can spin it from smallest dice to biggest dice, might be the difference between us, them, and them dead. So I call real good and then of course the apex item presumably for your dexterity but maybe charisma if you think you're going to be more facey maybe intelligence if you're more knowledgey maybe con so you don't die you know better than me so many spells today all about either doing a boatload of damage or just kind of letting us get up to shenanigans that the assassin would want to do once again gouging claw shocking grasp Pretty bread and butter for all magi. I feel like we are going to want to use leveled spells for our spell strike much more than the magi who is just cantripping since we only get the one. I feel like we're going big or going home and a true strike beforehand will help us make sure when we go big, it goes big into the, I can't even finish that sentence because I don't want to get demonetized, but you get what I mean. Invisibility eventually heightened to level four helps us keep getting our sneak attack procs no matter what and organ sight since, you know, again, we circle back to lots and lots of skill ranks, it will be pretty darn easy, even with a less than great wisdom, to be pretty good at medicine. Cast the spell. Presumably, you can get that big Nova off in 10 rounds. Throw one of our myriad lores, because again, oh my gosh, so many skills. Find the vital organ, get 46 extra precision damage, and then should they happen to survive, you could use that single action to attempt the special check again for extra more damage. Though, again, this might just be a thing we cast as, again, the villain is monologuing and the barbarian is shouting and screaming and the druid is frothing at the mouth and the barbarian is also frothing at the mouth. Though your mileage may vary depending on the state of the bad guy's kidneys. 
or lack thereof, our big angriest spell, Disintegrate, will be the spell we're trying to do the most casting of in combat, and I believe represents our biggest Nova. We'll want to heighten this up as high as we can. For two actions, you deal a base of 12d10 damage with a basic fortitude save on the end of it. On a critical hit, you treat the save result as one degree worse, kind of hearkening back to the playtest, Magus. If a creature is reduced to zero HP, they are reduced to fine powder. We all see why this is amazing, right? Use a seventh level Magus slot, slam 14d10 on top of boatloads of d4s and d6 and our decks. Barf. Barf, barf, barf. Now for some fun tech, what might be one of my favorite spells for this build at level three, it's a reaction shift blame. It's trigger, you or another creature attacks a creature or fails at a deception, diplomacy, or intimidate check at a range of 30 feet, targeting the target of the triggering attack. You alter the target's memories of the triggering event as they form. You choose another creature, which can be you, with the capacity to make the triggering attack or skill check, and you alter the target's memories to recall the creature you chose as responsible for the triggering attack. So if the bad guy has a friend standing next to him and your assassinate doesn't kill him, you just react, shift blame, hey, he did it. On a critical success, the target knows you attempted to mess with its brain. On a success, the target doesn't realize you attempted to alter its memories, though it knows you cast a spell, and in our case, presumably that you tried to garrot them. On a failure, you successfully alter the target's memory. It is not forced to react to the new memories in a particular way and is likely to question them if they contradict other information it knows or are implausible for the situation. At the very least, I'll wager this buys you a couple of actions as the bad guys are just scratching their head at each other though if you can get real creative with this spell because you can this kind of has your problems dealing with themselves which i think is really cool in a very similar vein hallucination for two actions the target consistently detects one thing is another can't detect something that's there or detect something that's not there though it doesn't alter their beliefs you choose which of these effects applies and you determine the specifics of the hallucination for example you can make the target see all elves as humans be unable to detect the presence of their brother see their beloved pocket watch on their person even when it isn't or not see the quills sticking out of their chest. Am I maybe leaning too hard into this? Yeah, maybe. But like Pathfinder 2nd Edition plays a lot more like a like a traditional game, like a game of, say, like Magic the Gathering. Reaction baiting is a thing. It's very hard as a GM to not have that in the back of your head when your monster is attacking. And even if you're not metagaming a little bit, most intelligent opponents will know, ooh, you look like a porcupine. That might hurt me. If we can make them forget the thing, that happened should they happen to survive or cast this beforehand to make your character appear as just like a normal human they might run smack into your trap card humanoid form does a very very similar thing fun fact polymorph spells don't take away your innate abilities so if you polymorph into a human elf dwarf what have you you gain their traits you gain any traits related to them but still have the ability to make that reaction to again activate your trap card and jam a spike into someone's throat and they die. This also gives you a sizable status bonus to deception, hence our charisma score not being just dumped because time to time you might need to lie your way out of a situation or use magic to help yourself lie out of a situation. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, God, we haven't done this in a long time. Let's do some damage math. So by level 20, we, masters of simple weapons with presumably a dexterity of seven, again with max investment in the apex item, are swinging our plus three fang wire at a plus 36 to hit. Or also, if we're true striking before the big angry punch him in the face rolling with advantage. Now it's been a little while in 2e since I've been able to point the math anywhere. We're not going to point it at Tree Razor today. Tree Razor's still a little too good and needs both legendary attackers and a whole party's worth of buffs and debuffs to like bring you in the ballpark. So that's a vacuum we can't point at. Let's instead point at a level 20 terrifying thing. In this case, Zotani the Fire Bleeder, Spawn of Rovagug. We need a 12 or better. Now, like we've said, our like spin up for most of our damage and things does take a little while to get going. The bulk of our damage is not coming from Mark for Death giving us deadly D10, but if you have three actions at some point when you're watching this thing tear apart a town or while the, I guess in this case, the champion is monologuing at it, 
since it can't speak any language, but you still gotta scold it. At some point between the combat breaking out and the death blow, though, the three actions to pull this off should be doable. The same is true for challenging the beast for one action, and then organ sighting for two. Once the organ sight fires up, and we stick the medicine check, that's when the timer's kind of ticking, but even if we're just sitting in the back fishing away. Over the course of 10 rounds of, again, our champion scolding the fire bleeder and then getting attacked by it, we should reasonably have enough time to fish for the extra 7d6 that heightening this spell up to 6th level will net you. Could we get an extra d6? Yeah, but I think I'd rather have the other disintegrate in my back pocket in case I need to disintegrate something. When we consider that precision damage is multiplied on critical hits, when we consider that precision damage is added onto weapon damage dice so it interacts with challenge in a beautiful way, and when we actually put the smack down with our greater striking fang wire, or like, again, with the serrated rune, greatest striking 5d4 plus dex, which lands at 7, plus an untyped 3 from weapon specialization, plus 4 from our assassin super backstabber, plus 1d6 force from the impactful rune, plus 13d6 precision from organ sight uh, precise debilitation and just being a cool rogue, then all of those added together for 19 in the challenge, and then for funsies, a 7th level disintegrate slamming him for 14d10 points of damage, the 44 will average out to 15, 14 d6 averages out to 49, and 14 d10 to 77, meaning our big Nova advantage hit will hit the target for 174 points of damage, or just a smidge over 45% of Zotani's health, which is quite a bit in a world where, again, like, you can't really optimize to solo things as a player. You have to optimize for teamwork to be good in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, in this case, the teamwork aspect being the champion buys you around while you power up, then slap the thing really hard, and then if you get hit, you can throw a billion D8s directly at them, punishing them for their insolence while the rest of the marshals are doing kind of similar. This damage will go up, down, left, right, but that's not inherently a bad thing because options are a thing that we can do. If we need to go invisible, if we have the extra action to turn our extra damage dice from a D4 to a D12, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox, and although this represents the literal nova only a little bit of damage falls off of this 77 on average which is a sizable chunk of it but not the whole thing if we're literally just sneak attacking which i happen to think is pretty darn good but that's all the time we have for today what do y'all think have we rolled it up what are we throwing at the bad guys throw it down in the comments let me know we'll be back at it next week for another episode of min maxing for fun and profit and until then we'll see you next time